Detective, you have spent more time making us sit and wait for you than anything else. Madame Van den Bosch, if you think I have spent my time focused on anything besides uncovering the Major's killer, you are sorely mistaken. I'm sure you will be eager to share your findings with us then. All in good time, Madame. Firstly, to understand the truth of what has occurred this weekend, one must know the timeline of events that not only preceded the Major's death, but succeeded. We are all well aware of what happened before, Detective. You can save your breath. You are only aware of what the guilty parties wanted you to believe. But now I shall apprise you to the true events. The reason for us all being here, you know. The altercation between Monsieur Demir and the Major, you know. The body of Monsieur Hagen was found while we were all sat enjoying a most delicious meal. That you also know. But what was kept from us all was that his body lay on the study floor for far longer than was thought. It was that servant! She found him! S'il te plaît, monsieur. It was indeed young Inga that found the Major's body lying lifeless in the study. So it was her! Monsieur, I will not allow for any further interruptions. Hmm. I return to the Major's body. If we are to believe the scene that we were presented with, the Major must have been killed during the first course of our meal, a meal that none of you left, even for a moment. Speaking in the evening, you all confirmed one another's alibis, and although there was doubt in the validity of some, I confirmed that they were indeed all true. What I could not understand was how a man came to be found dead, and every guest accounted for at the time of death. That is until I question the latter. Monsieur Beckers, I shall now allow you to speak. You saw the Major smoking a cigar in the snow. Is that true? It is. False. You saw what you were meant to see. Someone in the Major's coat, standing outside, giving the illusion that the Major was still very much alive. Monsieur Da Silva, on the afternoon of the Major's death, do you recall hearing a telephone ring? Now that you mention it, I have not heard a single ring all weekend. Correct. The telephone lines have been down for the duration of our stay. Meaning the telephone call that was received and promptly directed to the Major's study was yet another act of trickery and deceit. But it did not end there. When I entered the study for the first time, it was obvious someone had already been there and falsified the scene to stage a burglary and clear away important evidence, including the murder weapon. What followed was an investigation that had already been hindered. But even those lengths were not enough to derail me for long. I think we have all had enough of your self-praise, Detective. Perhaps you would like to tell us who killed him now? Madame, as I'm sure you would expect, it is not as simple as that. What many of you do not know is the discussion that was had between the Major and Monsieur Beckers earlier that day. What has that got to do with anything? I told you I didn't kill him! That I know to be true. What you do not know is that it was not only his ears that heard your spoken words. I hope you are not implying I had something to do with it. No, madame. There was another. Mademoiselle Elizabeth. You are all aware that the Major was hired by Monsieur de Silva to front the security during the workers' strikes. What very few of you know is that it was the Major's order that instigated the vicious attacks on those unarmed men and resulted in numerous deaths, including Mademoiselle Elizabeth's fiancé, Luc. Monsieur Beckers confronted the Major, declaring that he was to hand himself in. That is what Mademoiselle Elizabeth overheard. Now, knowing the truth, she waited until the Major was away from his study. After he stepped outside following the confrontation with Monsieur Demir's fist, 
It looked to be the perfect opportunity, or so she thought. The Major returned and found her looking for the proof she required to hand him over to the authorities. If the maid bumped him off, why hasn't she been arrested? The events that followed in the study are not those of a cold-blooded murder, but one of a young girl that had no other option but to protect her own life. Sounds to me, Detective, like you have taken a shine to this young girl and would rather protest her innocence than arrest her for murder, the crime she has committed. Jeez, this is going to make for a juicy story. Mademoiselle, I ask you this. You have seen the Major's anger before, oui? What if I have? How do you think he would have reacted if someone was to find proof that he had committed a terrible act and that if made public would surely result in his incarceration? Exactement. It is quite the story you have told, Detective, but all I have heard is that Elizabeth overheard a conversation blaming the Major for her fiancé's death, and she murdered him in revenge. A servant killing a man that is as revered as he was. She will face the noose. I am not denying that a man has lost his life, but it is not the crime of murder that you all believe. While the Major did not deserve to die in such a way, it was his actions towards Mademoiselle Elizabeth that drove her to defend herself in any way she could. Mademoiselle Elizabeth will be punished, but we will let the law decide the severity of her punishment. She has played you like a fiddle detective, acting the innocent victim. She will be arrested and hanged for her crime, like every other cold-blooded killer. Uh, here, here. Give her what she deserves. The girl has got to pay for what she's done. Those of you that are calling for the hanging of Mademoiselle Elizabeth, have you forgotten the roles you played? Your actions have been far from innocent. Look, Detective, I see where you are going with this, but it's not going to work. So maybe the strikes were down to De Silva and Beckers. But don't try and drag me into their mistakes. Mademoiselle Conrad, if you are so confident of your innocence, perhaps we should begin with you. You don't need to imply it's only me that does. Ask any of my journalists, they'll say the same. Even if in the process people are hurt? You knew the situation surrounding the strikes and only sought to swell the anger in people and create further chaos. Mademoiselle, you so often have something to say. Now is not the time for silence. You really are delusional. Maybe you should just keep your theories and claims to yourself. You obviously have no idea what goes on in my world. I would say stick to honest police work, but it seems that it's not in your field either. Look, it's... Mademoiselle, I do not have time for your excuses. Do you wish to state your direct involvement, or should I? It's not... I... Okay, fine. Yes, the story was going nowhere, there was a deal on the table, and it was going to be done and dusted. Everything you said is true. I wanted the story. The scoop that would have blown the others out of the water. I never wanted anyone to get hurt. But I can see what I did wasn't right. I didn't think you had this side in you. I can see now why Angeline asked for you personally. You're not like other cops. It's clear it's the law and doing the right thing through and through with you. If you say it was self-defense, I believe you. We can't just forget what that girl has done. It's not Jackie's fault or any of ours. 
and she decided to do what she did. Monsieur Beckers, you are the last person I expected to defend Mademoiselle Conrad. We talked only last night, and correct me if I am wrong, but you have already declared the role you played. To me, at least. Yes, we talked. It's just not fair of you to attack Jackie like that, putting words in her mouth until she succumbs to your plan. This is ridiculous. It was a peaceful strike. We only wanted what was deserved. Surely you do not think I sought to worsen the situation? Monsieur Beckers, you have taken the words from my mouth. Jackie was documenting everything to do with the strikes. She wanted our story to be heard and wanted to know how I was handling the negotiations. And they were handled by yourself? Naturally. If I cannot handle simple negotiations, I am not fit to be in the position I am in. I was only pushing for what my men deserved, what they needed. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, Detective. Surely you must know that. Nothing is ever simple, Detective. I'm sure you understand that better than anyone. You're right, Detective. I have tried so hard to deny my part, but I know only too well that my decisions led to the death of those men. I know I cannot excuse what I've done. I just want you all to know that I am not a hateful or malicious man. I only wanted to prove that I was the right man. I have lived in other shadows for so long. I thought I would be able to finally step into the light and be the one that everyone remembered, not forgot. Monsieur da Silva offered me a deal and I turned it down. I thought I was doing right by the workers. But it was only myself I was thinking about. What more proof do you need? He said it himself. I made a generous offer to reach a resolution and he turned his nose up at it. It was not that simple though. We, oui, an offer was made. But Monsieur Beckers and the workers would never have been forced into that position had their working conditions been satisfactory to begin with. This is outrageous! Do you plan on blaming everyone for doing their jobs? I suppose it makes you feel better about yourself, doesn't it? It may be a big deal to you, but I am used to workers not being happy with something. And most of the time, that unhappiness is directed at me. When you're in charge of your own factory, you'll understand. I handle the situation the best I could. If you think otherwise, maybe you have proved us all right that you aren't the great detective you claim to be. You said it, anonymous. I don't know them and it doesn't sound like they know me. When you have something people want, money, they will do anything, including constructing lies to get their hands on it. Monsieur da Silva, you seem to have forgotten our previous conversations. I recall them just fine, thank you. A police officer trying to manipulate facts to fit his own agenda. Shocking. Is that what you plan to do? Accuse us all of something until we feel enough guilt that we agree to allow the girl to walk free? The events that led to the Major's murder are not as simple as you have tried to convince yourself. I have uncovered what initiated both the murder of your workers and of the Major. It is you that refuses to accept the truth. Apparently anyone can become a detective now. I really don't know how you gained your title. 
Through order and th Order? <laughs> There's no order in beating down who you consider suspects until they have no other option but to admit something, guilty or not. Monsieur da Silva, you have stood steadfast and your opinion on your involvement has not wavered. Detective, you would do well not to anger my friends. It was not my intention. I only want those responsible to be held accountable for their actions. The Major's death does not fall on one person alone. Does your position on Mademoiselle Elizabeth's guilt remain the same? Even after all your attempts, Detective, Felix was still murdered. Self-defense or not, she chose to hide what she had done because she knew what she had done was wrong. And she will be punished for it. It was not choice to hide anything, madame. If in her position I ask what would you have done? The Major has already furiously thrown an object at you, barely missing your head, and now has hold of your arm. I wouldn't have driven a knife into him, that I can tell you for sure. She is no fool. She intended to kill, not to defend. Quite presumptuous of you to assume violence is in his nature. Putting my own feelings towards the Major aside, he was not an honorable man, at least at some time in his life. He must have been for you to allow him in your house for so many years. So, even you confirm he had a history of aggression. I'm sure that is none of my business. Likewise, it is none of yours. The Major shot and killed a number of unarmed prisoners as they were bound and terrified, posing no threat. His actions are unforgivable, and should not be defended by anyone. You judge him so harshly, but I return the question. What would you have done in his position? He had made mistakes, I will not deny that. In those moments when a decision had to be made, it fell to him, and he did what he saw fit. not know the circumstances of it. If he made that choice, he must have thought there was no other option. S'il te plaît, madame. I ask that you consider everything you know of the Major carefully. My friend has been murdered in cold blood, and you have the gall to ask me to save her? I will see to it that your superiors know of your crooked tendencies and wavering morals. Elizabeth will hang for this. There is no more a fitting punishment for her crime. I knew that you had a cold heart, but never would I have expected to see you turn on a young girl so cruelly. Excuse me? She may have been the one that held the knife. But look at the monster that stood before her. It could not be clearer the type of man... No, I shall refrain from offending men everywhere. The type of creature that he was. He bribed, he extorted, he murdered. And yet when he attacks a young girl and she does us a favor and stops him for good, she is punished. I'm sorry, Margot, but I am struggling to understand why you have involved yourself in this affair. Because that girl does not deserve your judgment. You should be ashamed of yourself. You all should be for allowing this to happen. Countess, I have talked at length of the Major's death, but not the reason for my invitation in the first place. When I last gathered you all together, I spoke of a blackmail ring that was rife in the area. 
and then of the letter that the Major had received. Mademoiselle Angeline requested my help personally after she received such a letter threatening her family name. She felt I was the only one that could uncover the truth. And uncover the truth I have. Get on with it, detective. Who dared try and extort my family and then have the gall to allow me to welcome them into my home? If it was not for the honesty of a young servant, I would perhaps still be looking for the cup. For goodness sake, it was me. Margot, how could you? While it looked as though the Countess was helping the young women at the shelter, she was in fact only finding them positions of employment in wealthy homes to gather information on them and learn secrets that she would ultimately be able to use against them. Monsieur da Silva fell victim to her network of moles and was in turn blackmailed. It was quite the prosperous setup you had, knowing that they would not be prepared to lose their social standing if a secret was to find its way from where it had been hidden for so long. That cannot be true, Margot. How could you do such a cruel thing? That is rich, coming from you. You are one of my oldest friends. High and mighty, Madame Vandenbosch. You think you can do what you wish, when you wish it, and there will be no repercussions. You are as bad as all of them. If I do not get a straight answer out of you, I will march you to the police station myself. I'm surprised it took the Major this long to start living with you. He must have been on the edge for some time. How dare you speak to me like that? In my own home! A home you share with the father of your daughter for so many years, and she still remains none the wiser. You have no right! Maman! Angeline! Have you heard what she has admitted to? She is merely trying to make herself... Is what she says true? Felix, he was my father? That is the secret that the letter was talking about, isn't it? You told me that we had nothing to hide. Detective Poirot, were you aware of this? Oui, mademoiselle. But it was not my place to repeat. I don't understand. What about father? Your mama betrayed the love of a good, honest man and played away behind his back and then kept it hidden for all these years like a lady of the night with her client list. Don't you will say no more. Angeline, I... Did Felix know? This is not an appropriate conversation. He knew, dear girl. He knew the whole time. It is only dear Edwin that was blind to their deceit. You will not talk of him like that. You will not talk of him at all. If I don't, who will? You never deserved him. You don't even deserve the memory of him. Countess, there is something that you still have not explained. What more is there for her to say? How long were you in love with the Viscount for? Marco? Is that true? We were destined to be together. And then you turned up. And I was all but forgotten about. But you were nothing more than friends. And you made sure of that, didn't you? From the day you arrived, it was all about what you wanted and what you had to do to get it. You didn't consider Edwin at all. He was just a purse to you. I loved my husband. And I miss him every day. Loved him enough to stray? Both of you, no more. Please, Angela, let me explain. Maman, I do not wish to hear anything else from you. Not even your own daughter wants to hear your lies anymore. Cassandra Vandenbosch, all alone. How dare you!
While I feel a sense of satisfaction and pride in solving both cases, there is still a part of me that is reluctant to revel in triumph. I am content with the unmasking of Countess de Vos as the blackmailer, and knowing that she will pay for her crimes. But it is the justice for Mademoiselle Elizabeth that worries me. She will stand in a court of law, and I can only hope that they can see she acted in self-defense. I must trust that our legal system and justice will prevail, and a fair sentencing will be given. In protecting her own life, she took the life of another. Perhaps the guilt she must live with is a greater punishment than any sentence she can receive. Countess de Vos was taken from Nemozine House in cuffs and placed under arrest. Although she initially tried to plead her innocence, Inga, along with a number of other girls that the Countess had found employment for, came forward and made full statements. She was charged with five counts of blackmail and extortion and sent to a house of corrections where she will have a new life to become accustomed to. Monsieur Sterling and Mademoiselle Rayana were also reprimanded for their participation. While they may not be facing time in prison, tampering with a crime scene and obstruction of a police investigation are certainly not something that houses and new employers will look positively on. Mademoiselle Angeline finally became Madame Demir, and together they took up residence in England, where Monsieur Demir continues to support and fight for fairness and equality in London. I am happy to say that we have remained in contact, and Madame Demir has become a regular correspondent of mine. And the latest joyous news is that they are expecting a child of their own. After Madame Vandenbosch's secret was revealed to the world, her position in the social hierarchy was no more, disappearing in a moment. While she still resides in Belgium, I believe she has had to adapt to a far more modest way of life. A humbling experience for her, I am sure. Madame Demir has not mentioned her maman in a single letter. After the discovery of her real father and how she had been lied to for so many years, I am not surprised if her departure from Belgium was somewhat an act of separation from her maman. Mademoiselle Conrad left Nemosine House the same way she entered, confident in herself and audacious in her opinions. Her report of the Major's murder at the house and the surrounding blackmails became one of the most talked about stories of the year. While there were certain details of her own involvement that did not make it to print, she was really quite complimentary about the detective at the heart of the case. Monsieur da Silva tried to continue in his position as factory owner and business entrepreneur, but after his accounts and business dealings were investigated following the details of his blackmail being made public in Mademoiselle Conrad's article, his illustrious business empire began to crumble and is now facing an international corporate investigation. Monsieur Becker stepped down from his position as union leader, accepting that he was no longer fit to represent the workforce that, in his words, he had let down on a scale of unmeasurable proportion. Although he is no longer the voice of the workers, he continues to support them from behind the scenes. Monsieur Zachariah and his brother made amends, and returning to his family home, and after sobering up, he was able to find the help that he required. I understand that he is now helping fellow soldiers with similar conditions. And Mademoiselle Elizabeth. She stood before a court and was found guilty of second-degree murder. She was sentenced to time in a female correctional house on the outskirts of the city. Alone in a foreign country with no friends or family for support, it will certainly be a hard life for her there. Her mental and physical strength will surely be tested to their limits, but she could not go unpunished. Without repercussions, we would become a society of animals. The death of Elizabeth's beloved Luke has been at the center of everything. Had those in positions to help not acted with only themselves in mind, perhaps he would still be alive today 
and the Major would have paid the price for his own crimes in the eyes of the law, not at the blade of a knife. The blood of Major Felix Egan will remain on Elizabeth's hands, a stain that wherever she is and whatever she may do, she will never be able to wash clean. However, it will remain as a reminder to not only her, but all of us, of what we as human beings are capable of to protect ourselves. We all have something that may be considered shameful or sinful, and it is how we deal with it that shows our true character. Those involved in the riots, the workers' deaths, and the Major's killing believed themselves to be untouchable. Whether it was from their social standing or their confidence in themselves, they learned that everyone is accountable for their actions. There is no exemption because of the suit you wear or the money in your bank account. There is no price to a man's life. It cannot be bought or traded or discarded. No man is better than another, including Detective Hercule Poirot. Thank you.